There are a lot of magnets in the tunnel of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. To be precise, there are 9,593 of them, located inside a series of cylinders in the tunnel. Each type of magnet performs a specific task. In the big blue cylinders, they deflect the proton beam. In the medium-sized white cylinders, they focus the proton beam. In many small cylinders around the ring, they prevent various kinds of beam imperfections. In fact, there are more than 50 types of magnets in the LHC, and that makes this giant machine quite delicate to operate. But despite all that variety, there is one thing all the LHC magnets have in common. They are not these kind of magnets. They are not the permanent magnets you would find on your fridge or on a whiteboard. They are all electromagnets. They are basically metallic wires wound into many, many loops, which generate a magnetic field only when there is an electric current in the wire. So, how do electromagnets work? And why do we use them instead of permanent magnets? And if we can use an electric current to create a magnetic field, couldn't we do the opposite? Can a magnetic field create a current? This video is the second part of our electromagnetic adventures. If you have not watched part one, please make sure to do so before you watch this video. Today, we'll delve deeper into the interplay between electric currents and magnetic fields. We'll start with electromagnets, then we'll explore the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction, explain the basic rules that govern it and investigate eddy currents and their applications. Let's begin! Let's recap what we know about magnetic fields from the first video in this series, how to steer a proton. Static electric charges only create an electric field, while moving electric charges create an electric field and a magnetic field. They are the two components of the electromagnetic field. When there is an electric current through a conducting wire, we have moving electric charges that should create an electric and a magnetic field. But when we have a current, the charges don't build up in the wire, the wire doesn't get excess electric charges, so it stays electrically neutral. Therefore, the wire with the current only creates a magnetic field around it. In turn, that magnetic field can give rise to a magnetic force on object close to the wire, which can feel its effect. Those objects can be another metal strip with a current, like we saw in this experiment, where two wires attract each other, or in that one, where two wires repel each other. But it can also be a permanent magnet, like this one here, which definitely attracts the wire. Let's look in more detail at the magnetic field created by a long, straight copper wire carrying a current. We'll pass a strong current through the wire. Now, the magnetic field created around one single wire is quite weak and difficult to detect. So to make it easier for us, we are going to use a bundle of 10 wires instead. These will just increase the strength of the magnetic field 10 times. To detect the field, we will use a grid of magnetic needles, which rotate until they are aligned in the direction of any strong magnetic field. So here is the grid of magnetic needles, with the copper cables going through the center of the grid, perpendicularly to it. At the moment, there are no strong magnetic fields around, so the needles are pointing in random directions. When we turn the power supply on, all the arrows rotate to orient themselves along circular path. If we reverse the direction of the current in the wires, the arrows orient themselves in the opposite direction. So, the motion of electric charges inside the wire creates a magnetic field directed along circles around the wire. And we expect the field to be stronger close to the wire and weaker far away from it. Then the magnetic field can be represented like this. If the current is directed downwards, then the field points in the other direction. Just as a comparison, 
This was the electric field generated by an electrically charged particle at rest, which we introduced in the previous video. You can see that the magnetic field tends to curl around the cable, while the electric field diverges radially from the charged particle. You could say that the magnetic and electric fields have very different personalities. One is going around in circles, while the other one is very straightforward and direct. In the rest of the video, instead of representing all of these arrows, we will simplify the depiction of the magnetic field around the cable to these, just one curved arrow. Now, what happens if instead of having a straight wire, we have a looped wire like this one, with a current in the clockwise direction? Well, from up close, every portion of the loop is almost a straight line, so we can draw a curved arrow here, and here, and here and we start to get a three-dimensional feel for the magnetic field around the loop. At the center of the loop, we can notice that all the curved arrows point in the same direction. The fields from each portion of the loop add up, and we get a strong resulting field pointing perpendicularly to the loop. We can simplify this again by drawing only one arrow, representing the strongest part of the field. There is a simple trick to figure out in which direction this final arrow is pointing, using your right hand. If the current is anticlockwise around the loop, curl your fingers anticlockwise. The magnetic field is pointing in the direction of your thumb, towards the front. If the current is clockwise, curl your fingers the other way, and your thumb points to the back. That's beginning to look very interesting, but now, what if we stacked multiple loops together? We would get something like this, a large region of space at the center of this sort of cylinder where there is a strong uniform magnetic field. To make this in practice, we typically take a long wire and wind it until we have a shape that looks a bit like a spring. But to increase the strength of the magnetic field, we don't wind it only once, as the field created by just one loop is quite weak. We do it many, many times. And we end up with something like this. This is what a simple electromagnet looks like. We say that the wire is wound into a coil. If there's an electric current in the wire, then there's a magnetic field outside and inside the coil. And the field inside the coil, oriented in this direction, is particularly strong and uniform. If there is no electric current in the wire, then there is no magnetic field. And that's what's really convenient about electromagnets. Contrary to permanent magnets, you can switch them on and off, and even control their strength by adjusting the intensity of the electric current in the wire. Now that we better understand how simple electromagnets work, let's talk about the LHC dipole electromagnets. You will see they are very special. First, we use electromagnets in the LHC because we need to ramp up the strength of the magnetic field over time. After the protons are injected into the accelerator, they get a boost in energy each time they pass through the radio frequency cavities. So, with every turn, as they gain more and more energy, it's getting more and more demanding to steer them. If you have been on one of these as a child, you know that the faster it spins, the harder you have to grip the bars to stay on the same circular trajectory. That's the same in the LHC. We need the Lorentz force to get stronger and stronger to keep the protons on the same trajectory around the ring. And this can only be achieved with electromagnets. Second, the layout of the coils is such that we get a uniform vertical magnetic field throughout the entire length of the dipole. This is what they look like. It's a series of elongated loops of conducting wire wound together in a very specific shape. The coils we can find in the dipoles in the tunnel are actually much longer. They are 15 meters long. In each dipole magnet, there are four of those. We can see their extremities sticking out of the ends of the blue cylinders in this animation. There are two coils sandwiching the pipe in which the protons move clockwise around the LHC and two coils sandwiching the pipe in which they move 
anticlockwise. For each dipole, there is a very intense electric current of about 12,000 amperes in each of the four coils. The direction of the electric current in each coil is set so that across the beam running clockwise, we have a magnetic field directed up, and across the beam running anticlockwise, we have a field pointing down. This way, both proton beams are deflected in the same direction by the Lorentz force, towards the center of the ring of the LHC, and they follow their trajectory through the pipes nicely instead of smashing into the walls. But, and this is our third and last fact, having that much current in an electromagnet has an unavoidable consequence. It generates huge magnetic forces which tend to rip the coils apart. As we saw in this demo, two wires carrying currents going in opposite directions repel each other. So, just like in our demo, the long and straight opposite sides of the dipole loops repel each other. But here, Unlike in our demo, the strength of the magnetic force is enormous. A force with the same strength would be enough to leave 15 jumbo jets like this one. To prevent the dipoles from ripping themselves apart, we lock the coils in place with steel collars, precisely engineered to withstand that much force and to keep the deformations of the coil below a small fraction of a millimeter. There are many, many other cool facts to learn about the LHC dipoles, but these are stories for future videos. Today it's enough to know that we can design and use strong magnetic fields from currents running in conductors. In the rest of this video we are going to ask ourselves the opposite question. Can we generate electric currents from a magnetic field? Here is a coil of copper wire. It is connected to a device that measures electric currents. If the needle moves to the right, it means that we are detecting a current in the coil in the clockwise direction. If the needle moves to the left, then the current is anticlockwise. Now, here is a very strong magnet. Let's place it inside the coil. We see the needle move as we bring the magnet forward. If we keep the magnet in place, the needle goes back to the center. If we take the magnet out of the loop, the needle moves again, but in the other direction. Let's do this again. The faster we move the magnet, the more the needle swings. We just revealed an intriguing phenomenon linking magnets with electric currents called electromagnetic induction. The first successful induction experiments were performed in 1831 by an English scientist, Michael Faraday, and also by an American scientist, James Henry. The explanation of the phenomenon was given three decades later by James Clerk Maxwell. Electromagnetic induction is the creation of an electric current in a conductor under the influence of a changing magnetic field. Here, the important word is changing magnetic field. As we saw, it's not enough to have a static magnetic field. The conductor and the magnet must move relative to each other. That means we can have a moving magnet and a static coil, like we saw, or a static magnet and a moving coil that works too. In this second situation, we can understand what's going on from what we already know. Inside the conductor, there are electrons that are free to move around. So, by moving the metallic coil in the magnetic field created by the magnet, we are actually moving those free electrons perpendicularly to the magnetic field. That creates a Lorentz force on those electrons directed along the wire. The force makes the electrons go around the loop. That's an electric current. In short, when neither the magnet nor the coil are moving, nothing happens. When either one of them moves, we create an induced current, an electric current generated in the coil by electromagnetic induction without being connected to a power supply or a battery. But wait a minute. In the first part of this video, we said that all conducting wires carrying an electric current generate a magnetic field. Well, that also applies to the induced current in our coil then. The induced current should create its own magnetic field, which we will call the induced magnetic field. Let's back out for a moment before we dive too deep into the rabbit hole. 
we have a moving permanent magnet providing what we will call the external magnetic field. The motion of the magnet creates an induced current in the coil. In turn, this induced current creates an induced magnetic field. OK, so now let's see what we can find out about the induced magnetic field. Let's go back to our experiment. When we push the magnet towards the coil, we detect an anticlockwise current. As the magnet gets closer and closer to the coil, the coil sees a magnetic field which increases over time. As the induced current is anticlockwise, we know that the induced magnetic field points towards the magnet. When we pull the magnet away from the coil, we detect a clockwise current. As the magnet gets farther and farther from the coil, the coil sees a magnetic field which decreases over time. As the induced current is clockwise, this time the induced magnetic field points away from the magnet. So, if we summarize, when the external field increases with time, the induced field points against it. When the external field decreases with time, the induced field points alongside it. So the induced magnetic field does exactly the opposite of what we do with the external magnetic field. It makes it hard for us to move the permanent magnet when we bring it closer. It pushes back against it and when we take it away, it pulls it back in. This was understood for the first time by Baltic German physicist Emil Lenz in 1834. So today we remember it as Lenz's law. The induced magnetic field generated by the induced electric current is always created in a direction which opposes the change in the external magnetic field. When you think about it, Lenz's law actually makes a lot of sense. Imagine we lived in a twisted world where Lenz's law was turned on its head. In this world, bringing the magnet closer would produce an induced field pointing away from the magnet. That would mean that the induced magnetic field would actually reinforce the external magnetic field. It would be as if we had a stronger magnet in the first place. But a stronger magnet would also mean a stronger induced current in the coil. In turn, that would create a stronger induced magnetic field. But since in this world it points away from the magnet, that would make the external field even stronger and everything would spiral out of control. This would create an infinitely strong current in the coil from the slightest movement of the magnet. And that would be too easy if we could create infinite electricity just like that. In the real world, we don't get a current in the coil for free. We have to work for it. We have to spend kinetic energy in order to get electrical energy. In the next chapter of this video, we'll get a better feel for what that means and focus a bit more on the nature of the induced current. Let's do another coil and magnet experiment. This time, we'll hold the coil in a very different way. It's only attached in one spot, a bit like a swing. If we quickly bring a strong magnet next to it, we can push the coil without touching it. Let's see what this looks like. Let's see that again, a bit slower this time. Another thing we can do is to take the magnet away quickly. Then we'll be able to pull the coil along, also without touching it. And here it is again, in slow motion. It looks as if the coil really doesn't want to have anything to do with such a pushy magnet, but then changes its mind and doesn't want to let go when the magnet leaves. In reality, in the first situation, the induced magnetic field and the external magnetic field point in the opposite direction, while in the second situation they point in the same direction. Here we are witnessing a short-lived magnetic force. It only exists for as long as an electric current exists in the coil. And while the current is initially created by the change in the external magnetic field, it eventually fades away because of the conductor itself. 
Indeed, although metals like copper are great conductors of electricity, they are not actually perfect conductors. That's the concept of electrical resistance. Conductors oppose the flow of electricity to a small degree, so eventually electric charges moving through a conductor to come to a stop. That's exactly what's happening here. The induced currents are short-lived, and as soon as they die off, the coil stops being pushed away from the magnet and falls back towards it, or stops being attracted to the magnet and falls back away from it. Here is one last experiment to prove to you that the induced currents are key to all of these. Let's cut open our copper coil. Here we have open electrical circuits, so no currents can exist in our damaged coil. When we bring the magnet closer, the damaged coil stays absolutely still. When we take the magnet away, nothing happens either. This is really a striking illustration of the difference that induced currents can make. The magnetic force is also present in our very first induction experiment, with the moving magnet and the static coil, but the way it manifests itself in that situation is not something we can easily show in a video. Moving a strong magnet across a few loops of copper is a breeze, but across a few thousand loops stacked on top of each other it can get pretty difficult. You can feel that you have to push harder to generate the same electric current when there are more loops, because the induced field is stronger. This mechanical resistance is the manifestation of the magnetic force. You feel in your arm that you need to spend mechanical energy in order to get electrical energy. It's actually pretty weird. It feels like you are dragging your magnet through honey instead of air. In fact, we could even push this experiment to its limit. Let's imagine we stack up so many loops together that we form a very long, very thick coil. Well, instead of a coil of conducting wire, it's almost as if we had a cylinder made of solid conducting metal. Let's investigate what happens to a magnet dropped through a thick copper tube. Here is our copper tube. It's made of cylindrical blocks with a portion of the circle cut off, so we can see what's going on inside. Here is a spherical magnet. If we drop it, it just falls down as we would expect. But if we drop it inside the copper tube, it takes forever to hit the ground. So what's going on here? Well, we are seeing the magnetic force in action. It's resisting the motion of the magnet caused by gravity. Electric currents are induced in the copper tube, except that they now flow in loops across the thickness of the copper tube. They create magnetic fields of their own, and in turn, these induced magnetic fields interact with the field of the moving permanent magnet. As a result, the fall of the magnet is slowed down. So basically, this experiment shows that we don't need wires or electric cables to create induced currents. Actually, they can be induced in a metallic object of any shape. It's easy to predict how an induced current can exist in a loop of wire, because the only thing it can do is follow the wire. But in blocks of metal, it's a bit more complicated. In this case, induced currents are known as eddy currents. Loops of current can form in all directions throughout the metal, a bit like the turbulent eddies and vortices which form in a river that's flowing very fast. There are many applications of eddy currents in our everyday lives. One of them is magnetic braking. Basically, we are just using the fact that they are pretty good at slowing magnets down. Here is a magnet attached to a pendulum. If we let it go, it's going to keep swinging for a long time, because the only thing which can slow it down is friction with the stuff around. But that's going to take a while. Let's do the very same experiment, but this time let's put a giant block of copper right under the pendulum. We let it go from the very same height, and that's it! It immediately grinds to a halt. Note that here the magnet and the copper are not touching, and that we did not film these in slow motion. This is real-time footage. So, here, the induced magnetic field generated by eddy currents in the copper is strong enough to suddenly stop the motion of our pendulum. 
you can find this kind of break in technology in much bigger systems outside of the physics lab, such as high speed trains and roller coasters. If we recap what we saw, we have a moving magnetic object with a lot of kinetic energy. When eddy currents are induced in a nearby conductor, most of that energy is transformed into electrical energy. But in turn, the eddy currents die off once the magnetic object stops moving because the conductor has an electrical resistance. In fact, what happens is that the electrons moving inside the conductor constantly bump into the atoms of the material and by doing so transfer a bit of their energy to the conductor itself, which ends up warming up. That process is known as resistive heating and the final form the energy takes at the end of this process is known as thermal energy. And that's the second major application of eddy currents in everyday life. We can use them to heat stuff. Here is a copper disc mounted on a drill. We have painted one side of the disc black to help us measure its temperature with an infrared camera. Here is a strong magnet. We bring it close to the disc without touching it and start spinning the disc. We have a static magnet and a moving conductor, so we are going to induce eddy currents in the copper disc. Through resistive heating, these eddy currents warm up the spinning disc. On the infrared camera footage, we can see the color of the disc change progressively. That's showing us that the temperature of the disc is increasing quite a lot. If you have an induction cooktop at home, it works in a similar way. A changing magnetic field created by the stove induces eddy currents in the bottom of a conducting pot and resistive heating raises the temperature of the pot, enabling you to cook your food. Eddy currents can be really useful, except when you want to operate a particle accelerator. Here, at CERN, we usually want to avoid eddy currents. When we power the LHC, we use energy with the goal of accelerating protons. We don't want to waste energy slowing things down or heating things up. In particle accelerators, eddy currents can form in the beam pipe, the metallic tube that surrounds the proton beams. They could be easily avoided using an insulating material for the beam pipe. However, we can't do that because sometimes protons stray off of the beam and land on the wall of the pipe. If the pipe was an insulator, positive electric charges would accumulate over time on the wall and disturb the beam with their electric fields. Eddy currents are particularly problematic for one type of magnet we haven't talked about yet, kicker magnets. It's pretty easy to guess what kicker magnets do. They kick the protons. In circular accelerators, they inject the protons in the ring or eject them out of the ring. They are exactly like railway switches, but for trains of protons. They are very unique dipole magnets that must be turned on and off incredibly quickly, in less than a microsecond. A magnetic field that strong, rising and falling over such a small period of time, would create huge eddy currents in the beam pipe. Those eddy currents would be very inconvenient. First, they would heat up the beam pipe way too much. Second, they would create an induced magnetic field fighting against the field of the kicker magnet, making the whole system inefficient, if not completely pointless. That's why inside the kicker magnet and only in that very small section of the accelerator, the beam pipe is made from an insulating material. In this video, we have played a lot with coils and magnets, but what did we learn? Let's recap. An electromagnet is a conducting wire looped many times that creates a magnetic field when there is an electric current in the wire. Electromagnetic induction is the creation of an electric current in a circuit under the influence of a changing magnetic field. The current generated by a changing magnetic field creates a magnetic field of its own, called the induced field. The induced field is always created in a direction which opposes the change in the external magnetic field. This is known as Lenz's law and is linked to the conservation of energy. 
Induced electric currents don't just form along wires. They can also be induced in conductors of any shape, like blocks of metal in which they can form in multiple directions. They are then known as eddy currents. Eddy currents have various applications, including braking and heating, as they convert kinetic energy into electrical energy, which in turn is transformed into thermal energy. That's all for now. Thanks for learning with us. In the third video of this series, we are going to address the elephant in the room. They have been everywhere since the first video, but we still don't know how permanent magnets work. Stay tuned for that and see you soon in the next video. Thank you.